I'm shot, as he stumbled into the apartment's complex entrance. In March 1981, President Reagan was seriously wounded in a very similar close-range assassination attempt in Washington, D.C. Upon surviving, Ronald Reagan privately wrote that he would dedicate the remaining years of his life, quote, to serving him, unquote. Into that world of politics, music, and faith was born our son, Nathan Dennis Mansfield. Okay. Nate was born in Southern California in July of 1981. Like so many evangelical parents in the early 1980s, we treated the birth of our, of our children as if each were almost a holy event. For in comparison to how abortion had robbed so many couples of their children, it seemed to us to be a holy event indeed. We saw God's face in the tiny little images of brand new babies. Though we knew the admonition to worship only the, the Lord, and, and we felt we followed that admonition, there was a type of worship, worship that accompanied the birth of many children within the Christian community 30 years ago. In many ways, the Christian community has always appreciated and embraced newborn children, since Scripture speaks repeatedly of the importance of raising children. The most noteworthy verse states that, we should, that they should be raised so that when they grow up they will not depart. But something seemed different in the years of the Jesus movement and beyond. Child-centeredness is a behavioral pattern, pattern that, among many other things, allows the child to gain center stage in the family with the parents treating that infant, that toddler, that elementary school child, and then young adult, primarily as a friend. The child sets the tone and the direction for the family, rather than the parents. Child-centeredness became the Christian community's response, in many ways, to the secular world's discarding of infants in the womb by abortion. On the one hand, Planned Parenthood assisted in the deaths of millions of babies in utero so that the parents would be free of child raising responsibilities. Planned Parenthood's initial motto was every child a wanted child, but within the Christian community, on the other hand, an equally offensive motto began to take hold. Every child a worship child. Child centeredness set the stage for a type of child rearing that had even been done be that had never been done before. The personal worth and value of the child were clearly acknowledged, yet without proper discipline boundaries, it set the stage for a fear-based selfishness that arose in the parents and ultimately in the children being raised. Intentional parenting anchors itself instead to timeless proven truths for all children. Child centeredness treats an individual child as if he or she is so unique that no general rules of behavior apply to him or her. Intentional parenting encourages a selflessness that trumps the selfishness of child-centeredness. Children take their cues from whichever approach the parents choose. At what point do intentional parenting and child-centeredness cross? Well, that was what we were about to find out. The book talks about how in our family, we began to focus on our family in an unhealthy way, in a way that was child-centered, that was fear-based, that instead of dealing with the fact that we wanted to raise adults, we found ourselves with our firstborn, raising children. It's an important and key thing to look at. And so in the book, I talk about that, and I examine different things. It was a very difficult thing to write because all of a sudden, our son Nate found himself choosing the underbelly of life, choosing the things that had nothing to do with the life that we had given him. And then incarceration began. Incarceration. The lyrics of John Lennon's song, Beautiful Boy, were prophetic in many ways. Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Our years worth of making other plans for entrance into the U.S. congressional race in Idaho had blown up in our faces when he was arrested. Not unlike so many families who face the agonizing and unexpected interruptions of their lives by sons and daughters who are sidetracked by drugs, mental illness, and victimization. We honestly did not know where to turn. After so many years of directing parents as to how they should raise their children, I looked the hypocrite and possibly was one on many levels. Susan and I believed the child raising involved a methodical step-by-step -step process. And we believed that if you followed these steps, that you were guaranteed success. But that's not how things turned out. We now found ourselves with no method that worked and no process that had been successful with our oldest child. Nothing worked. 
Chief to our dismay was the fact that Nate was our oldest child. A little over three years separate him from our second child, Meg, and almost 11 years from our third, Colin. So for all we knew, the next two kids were on a similar path that would duplicate many of the problems that we currently faced with Nate. You can imagine how that felt. <laughs> See, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, we were ill-prepared to understand drug use, its impact, and ultimately the blowback by that. Nate was arrested uh, and ultimately did time in Ada County Jail and then was moved to Missouri where he did almost a year in prison in Missouri. It was a very, very difficult time. And every step of the way, I asked myself, what did I do wrong? What, what happened here? I'm the focus on the family guy. <laughs> Why didn't this work? Why didn't it work? What happened then was Nate was released from prison. I had to make a decision prior to his release. Susan and I did. And it was the question of whether we would receive him back from Missouri to Idaho or whether we would allow him to stay there and be responsible for his own actions. We chose to let him stay, to not bring him back. It was singularly the hardest decision that we made, but it was the best decision based on the reality that I still had a son to raise and a daughter who was married and, and on her own, but I did not want. I, I still had a protection, if you will, to make sure that he didn't do with his behavior something that would blow back on them. And so that began a whole different change and an entirely different change for our family. Then I came to the point shortly before, probably uh, uh, just, just uh, maybe six, six months before Nate died, where I had an opportunity where Nate and I did a road trip. And we began to talk, and I talk about it in the book. I think it's a, I think it's a great opportunity for you to read and see. But at the end of it, I asked myself, what have I learned from this? What have I learned from Nate's life and his death and the application of it for the purpose of uh, your lives and how it can encourage you and yours? Allow me to finish my formal reading time by just sharing with you about that. What I've learned. I've learned a lot since Nate's death on March 11th, 2009. I've learned a few things in my open failures that may be of service to you as you finish this book. I've learned that I don't have all the answers. In many instances, I don't even have the questions anymore. My past bravado at posing and pretending may have looked good, but it was not good. It was flawed. Admitting that I just simply do not know is both refreshing and completely honest. Many of us primp and position ourselves as if we are something when in reality we are failing. We often go to ridiculous extremes to hide our failures. More than that, many of us live our lives as though we're wearing our parents' clothes, hoping no one challenges us as adults, that no one discovers who we really are. We sneak into adulthood feeling as though we're not really adults. We position ourselves within a lie and then go about believing it. And then as believers in God, we lie to ourselves about believing in what he said is what he meant, especially the parts about loving ourselves and being valuable in God's eyes, just as we are. I often ask people of faith if they love themselves. The common answer I receive from born again evangelicals ranges from between, no, I, I don't believe we should love ourselves, to God wants us only to love him. I really shouldn't love myself. The intensity of the responses is interesting as well. Sometimes the words are laced with deep offense and anger toward me for even asking the question. My response each time is simple and straightforward. I say to them this. Quoting Leviticus, Jesus said that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love yourself, you cannot love your neighbor. Christians often stand dumbfounded. There's a prevailing sense of unintended lies in much of evangelical Christianity that have often been allowed to take root in the last 30 years. One lie says that loving ourselves is sin. Another says that there are secrets to child raising and good marriages, that only some have the secrets, and the rest of us should visit their websites. 
Ladies and gentlemen, here's the secret. Love one another. Yes. God said it in the Old Testament. God meant it in the Old Testament. God said it in the New Testament. God meant it in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Here to love one another. And, and I want you to know, tonight, as you have the opportunity to, to get this book and to share it with others, I give it to you in love, and I ask you to pass it on in love. Because the world needs that. The world needs to be loved and to love. And so I've asked uh, Maggie to come forward uh, because I love her. <laughs> it's a logical sequence, isn't it? I love this girl. It's like looking at my wife, you know, 28 years ago. Wow. Anyway, yeah, longer here. So we have. Did everybody get a ticket? Everybody get a ticket? And did you get two tickets if you brought cookies? Yeah, well, it's too late now because we're going to draw. Okay, so we're going to do five drawings. And if you got here after Dennis started talking, sorry, next time you should have been here. Yeah. Uh, no, I'll give you a ticket. No, no, I'll give you a ticket. Oh, that's too much mercy. All right. You can, you can tell which one is the Old Testament. Uh, New Testament. All right, Maggie, you heard me? Mom's wanting me to wait. Doesn't matter. We're going to go for what we got for the... Okay, you ready? So stop looking, Mom. Okay. You're done, baby. The first one, two, nine, eight, nine, two, zero. All right, say it again. Two, nine, eight, nine, two, zero. We're done. Who has that one? Everybody out there? Anybody? Say it one more time. Two, nine, eight, nine, two, zero. No? No. Nope. I'm sorry, you're the executive assistant to what, Pastor? You need one? Okay, next one. Nobody had that one. 298935. Oh! All right. Now, Sue, can you get the book for Natalie, please? Sure. Where are they? Natalie, follow Susan. They're back on the table or they're back in the back. Jim will help you. Work to hold the organizer out here. Okay, the next one, 298-904. Say it one more time. 298-904. All right, Natalie, over here. Natalie. Virginia Hall. Natalie's over there. Natalie. All right, so we got two, all right. 298-881. Come on. 881. <laughs> Who is it? Who's got anybody, anybody? it? Anybody in that? Come on, we got the caboose room over here. Eight, eight, one. Okay. Going once? Okay, here we go again. Two, nine, eight, nine, one, zero. Woo! Is that you? All right, there we go. It's oh, Cassidy. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Two nine eight eight seven four. Eight seven four. Who knows that one? Eight seven four. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. wow! Are you gonna read that whole thing yourself? <laughs> Man, that's a big guy. Okay, last one. Two nine eight eight nine eight. Yeah. All right. Coming. And ladies yeah, and gentlemen, what we're going to do is, and I'm going to be in the back, I think Colin's good to get the music out. There's cookies and punch. We want you to enjoy your time. Um, water. Which, thank you so much to everyone who brought cookies. That really was a huge help for us. So yes, you. it was. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Susan, uh, Allison, Heron, Allison Heron will help me over here on the side. And then uh, if, if you could start, I think Margaret Rodnett. Margaret Rodnett? Where's Margaret? Okay, Margaret Rodnett, if, it, if you can get behind Margaret Rodnett, here's tell, the first one. Tell where the books are for sale. Books are for sale here. At the counter at the right counter, there. And then make your way around behind Robert, uh, behind Margaret Rodnett. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, if you The line for the signing is going to be around this way. So if you want your book signed, come around this way. Thank you.